kind, uh, kind words, kind words. And, you know, it's always, it's always humbling, you know, every one of us on here, we, we, we do this deal. We came from a seemingly hopeless condition of mind and body and God strikes us silver. And then God recovers us if we're willing, right? If we're willing to uh, walk before God humbly, God does miracles in our lives every day. And, you know, um, um, that's what I seek to do. So Tamara, thank you. That was really kind. You know, that, that was very touching. So thank you. Uh, Ali, thank you for inviting me. And sorry if I put you through a heart attack there. I, I was actually on the line about seven till and <laughs> I don't think you could see me. And I know you're trying to look around. So um, anyway, and I know a bunch of a bunch of folks on this line and, and your meeting precedes itself in terms of uh, notoriety around the world. Um, you know, I, I have participated uh, many times in, in Fox meetings and uh, my I got sober, uh, God struck me sober July the 9th, 2002. And so I'm just coming up on 20 years. And what's noteworthy um, uh, for me is that I didn't realize how deep the roots that God was going to put me into when he put me into my home group in Denver. And I was really fortunate to get to know some people that inspired thoughts and uh, back, you know, years before I ever got sober and, and some people that I um, admire. And so before I start in a formal part of my conversation about my, my history with this topic tonight and my experience, not a teaching time, but just my experience, um, uh, Don P used to say that sobriety without solution is cruelty. And solution without love is brutality. And so wherever I go and whatever I'm doing with another uh, one of God's kids that's either struggling and trying to get sober, relapsing, sober for a bunch of years and drier than crispy critter toast or anything in between, I always try to remember that God, this is your kid just like I'm your kid. And we all come, we all come in here at a level playing field. No one's higher and no one's lower. And I take seriously uh, the suggestions of what a person who could carry the message to another suffering alcoholic that we don't have any, hopefully tonight, no lectures to endure. <laughs> that is a big time goal. No lectures. Okay. No lectures. And um, also, you know, no, a sincere desire just to communicate the blessing of what God's done. Okay. So Bill, you know, and I, I hadn't looked at, it was interesting. Ali asked me, he said, Hey, what do you want to speak on with the 11th step? And I love, love the 11th step. I love the 11th step, but I hardly ever speak about the 11th step out of the 12 and 12. So I'm talking to God about it. And I go, Papa, what, what do you want to do? And so I, I go looking around and I thought, you know what, let's, let's go take a look at that 12 and 12. And I read the 12 and 12 step 11 for the first time. And I'm not exaggerating and I'm not telling on myself, but I guess I am probably in about six months. I haven't looked at the 12 and 12, 11 step for probably six months. Just haven't read it because most of the work that we do with our, our folks out here in California is right out of the big book and not because we have anything against the 12 and 12 it's just out of the big book. All right. And uh, I'm reading through it and I go, man, Bill had some good stuff in here. Bill, he was he was sort of rocking it. He had he had some good points. And so Ali said, so pick a sentence. And I said, well, there's a bunch. And so I, I send Ali like this short lit, well, not short, short list by my mind. Ali's coming back going, it's not so short. And he said, you might want to, we, basically we said, you might want to cut it down a little bit. And so I, I'm going to read it back to us. We well remember page 96, something deep inside Pat that kept Pat rebelling against the idea of bowing before God. I'm going to take out the word a uh, God. I'm going to put in the word God because I think that's really what Bill intends. That's what I know my experience is. I, I go to what I believe is God. And when I first came in here, you know, um, not necessarily qualifying, but I just want to touch on it for a second. My life had come unraveled uh, physically. I, it wasn't working. I, I had a lot of stuff going on. I had Barrett's esophagus. I, I, had, I still slur my speech to this day. That's a permanent gift from, the, from my days out there uh, yonder. 
uh, doctor says you might want to control that drinking or cop, stop that drinking altogether. It's probably going to kill you. Your liver enzymes are a mess, and, and you're you're in uh, you're in some dark straits. wasn't enough. Uh, my first marriage, uh, uh, the gal who loved me dearly said, "Hey, you might want to control this this drinking." And I go, "Not so much." And so that wife went away. The second wife says, "You might want to control this drinking," and I go, "Not so much." And my children go, Pat, you might want to control this drinking. And I go, not so much. And so by the time I came in here, uh, I'd blown up two marriages. I had blown up my relationship with my three children. I'd blown up my business partnerships and I'd blown up my health. By the time I came wobbling into uh, a Denver, Colorado meeting, I didn't have any answers. But the irony of not having any answers I was absolutely sure that God would not be the answer. And some people come in neutral or positive about God. I was neither. I wasn't neutral about God and I was not positive. And I had given my life to God as best I know when I was 17 years old. And, I, and I'm 63 now and I didn't get sober till I was 43. And, you know, or 42, certain turn then to turn 43, I guess. Yeah. I can never remember my dates. My birthday's in July. So it was my sobriety date. And it's always a mess. I can never remember it all. But anyway, um, I had given my life to God. And I said, you know, by the time I'm a senior in high school, my high school coach is saying, Pat, you're a mess. No one can pronounce another person alcoholic, but you might want to go to some Alcoholics Anonymous meetings to find out your truth. And I didn't know why he was telling me that I'm floating Mickey's in the gutter of swim practice and I'm, I can't drive my car home. I'm parking on sidewalks that aren't where cars belong and I'm doing a bunch of stuff and I'm a blackout drinker on a daily basis. I don't go to class very often and I think life is, is okay. It wasn't a total disaster, but there were some consequences going on. And so uh, a gal that I really cared about said, you really do need to give your life to God. You need to give your life to God. And if you don't give your life to God, you're probably going to die. And there is enough. I don't, I don't want to uh, go into too much detail right now, but I thought it was a good idea. And so I give my life in all sincerity to God. And for the first time since I'm 14 years old, I'm not drinking every day. And for the first time since I'm 14 years old, I'm going home and I remember my name and I'm not uh, causing a lot of mayhem around. And I thought, this is great. My problem, what I thought was at the time, alcohol has been abated. And I don't know about permanently, I didn't even have that kind of a thought. But I basically thought, man, this God thing's working. I'm not drinking today. And this is pretty cool. And that went on for four whole months, folks. Four months, I didn't touch a drink. And that's a big deal. And then I go up to a party at my first night of college in Fort Collins, Colorado, and they have a welcoming party and a beer fest. And I thought, you know what? It's been four months. One beer is not going to really throw me off. I have the beer. And then I discover over the course of the night that um, I didn't know what the word was, but I couldn't control the number of drinks I had. I discover a thing called white lightning. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that Everclear. Have you guys ever heard of Everclear? Throw your thumb up if you ever heard of that. Maybe some of you. Well, it's grain alcohol. You got to be careful with it because it'll make you go blind physically when you're drinking and stuff. But man, I'll tell you what, it gets you to the promised land really quick. And I like getting there quick. I drank hard. I drank off and I drank for purpose. All right. And I find that in my recovery, I recovery hard. I recovery for purpose. I mean, I'm not casual about my recovery. I've never been casual about my recovery ever since I walked in these rooms. And so I, I literally had a beer that night and I ended up failing out of my freshman year in college. I wanted to be a veterinarian and I couldn't go to class. I, I never went, I, I, did, I don't remember going to class. I remember vaguely going to a few classes over a few months and then it's all blur. And the school, can you believe it, asked me not to return my following year. I thought it was a little bit rude. I'd paid them good money, my money, and they, they said, don't return. And so on goes through the years. And then I have another brief respite from uh, the drink. Um, uh, 1992, 1991, excuse me. 
and this is the I'm I'm not I'm not filling in all the gaps, but 1991, I I go through another spot where I I had some sobriety this time for about six months. I had really white knuckled, and I was convinced if I could just stay away from the drink, all my problems were going to go away. And in 1991, I win this sales contest, and they take me to this real fancy place on the eastern seaboard of the United States. And I and I'm nervous because I didn't grow up with a lot of money. I didn't grow up with a lot of culture. And there's white linen tables. There's crystal. There's chandeliers. And there's some really fancy stuff. And it's uncomfortable. It's intimidating. And my business sales manager could tell that I was not comfortable. And he says, Pat, why don't you just have a drink to take the edge off? And I thought, sales manager, that's a good idea. Every thought about not drinking and all the problems it caused me over the years, which I have great drunkologues, did not even enter my mind. And the next thing I know, I am looking, I am bare butt naked at the Atlantic seaboard coast, bent over, showing everybody my lollipops and everything I am to the president of the New York Stock Exchange. And I'm telling him he could kiss my butt because you need me more than I need you. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that I didn't come in here with a big ego. It was crazy. It's the insane stuff that we do. That doesn't make me an alcoholic, but I certainly didn't like the effects that produced by alcohol. What makes me an alcoholic is I can't control the drink once I start, the allergy of the body. What makes me an alcoholic is that I have a mental obsession that when for there's every good reason never to touch the stuff again, Pat, I can't stay away from it. It's plain insanity and I can't stop it from happening. And what I don't understand is the spiritual malady that Dr. Silkworth talks about, that I'm restless, irritable, and discontent, and that not even the drink, the delusion is not even the drink in the last 10 years of my drinking. By the way, 1992, to finish off that story, barely a sober breath to 1991 till 2002. My last run was 11 years. And in those 11 years, I destroyed two marriages, three children, uh, countless business opportunities, lost everything, including my sanity, my health, my way of life, my, 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 my marriages, everything there was. I come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous thinking, maybe, maybe I have a problem. Maybe I have a problem. I'm out of solutions on my own. And I'm being a little bit understated there. So I come in the room and this lady named Thalia said to me, and I haven't seen her a lot since, but she was solid in the work. And she said, Pat, you never have to feel the way you're feeling tonight ever again if you'll do what we've done. Come walk this path with us. And I thought what the path that she was talking about was just going to meetings. And I thought somehow by touching Brenda and touching Allie and touching Mickey and touching Jermaine and, and everybody else and Samantha, that all of a sudden, I'm just going to get what you guys got. That Pat T and James, you guys are going to give me whatever it is that you've got. I don't have to do anything except for show up. And what I found out in the early days of my sobriety is that I literally was homicidal and suicidal. It got worse, not better. Because, see, I was absolutely core convinced that my problem was alcohol. I didn't know that what my problem was with alcoholism. And I did not understand that when you separate me from the drink, page 51 stuff shows up in that I don't know why I'm having such heavy going of life. I don't know. And then I go through all this work, steps one, and I'm fast tracking because we got to get to step 11. We go all through this work, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, nine. And then I start getting some freedom. I start seeing some of these promises as I get halfway through my amends. And by the, by the way, I'm in the belief system and, and practice that we finish all of our amends, not, not some of them, all of them. It's not a sometime, not a part-time thing. It's an all-time thing. And so it doesn't matter how far, how deep, how long it takes, we do our amends. Some of my amends took eight or 11, eight, 11 years. One amends took 11 years to complete. It takes what it takes. But, you know, one of the things that one of the guys that I love, he's dead and gone now, he said, how free do you want to be? Do you want an ocean? Do you want a thimble full of God? Do you want an ocean full of God? I want an ocean. And here's the other thing. I didn't know I wanted God. Because, see, by nine months into my sobriety, Eight months into my sobriety, the wheels are coming off so badly, and I was very fortunate there was one guy in the rooms that was being sponsored by somebody that actually knew the work out of the big book and was turning the statements into questions, and thank you for my German shepherd's barking right when we're talking. It's okay, but he was turning statements into questions, and his life was changing, and he was taking the big book seriously like a textbook, and his life was changing. 
I mean, I'm watching a guy that's as bad as I am, and he's not acting and feeling and behaving the same way I am. He's still not drunk. I'm not drunk, but he's looking like he's starting to enjoy life. And I'm going, what's wrong with me? So I hounded that guy and I found out who his sponsor was and he wouldn't tell me, but I kept looking. I was like a detective. And the guy was looking at me going, I'm not telling you my sponsor because you're going to dominate all this time. I said, you're right. I'm going to take all this time. And so I found this guy and he was out of the lineage in Denver that did this work the way that you do this work in thoughts. And he said, Pat, your problem is spiritual. You have a spiritual malady and you don't know what's wrong with you. It is so deep in your soul, so deep in your heart that the Oxford group actually called it soul surgery is what's necessary for your life. And I had no idea what he's talking about. And then he says to me, I want you to take a look at those steps on the wall. And he, and he said, what do you think of those? And I said, not much. I'm not too impressed with that whole stuff about God. He said, why do you have such a problem with God? I said, God didn't deliver for me. I was 17 years old. I asked God to separate me from the drink and he didn't do it. Here I am. And my mess, my life's a mess. I asked God a thousand times to save me. I asked God a thousand times not to let me drink. I asked God every morning I woke up, said, God, please, God, not today. And folks on the call, I meant it. It was not a casual deal. I meant it from every fiber of my body. And if I would have been in the rooms, it would have been the same thing. You would have called me relapse Pat. That's who I would have been. I did all my relapsing for the last 11 years of my drinking, trying to get into these rooms, not even know what these rooms were. I tried to get sober. So I have a lot of heart for a relapser because I understand that deal. Because the truth of my step one is that I will drink. It's not that I won't drink. It's that I will drink. And that unless there's a power greater than me, separate me from the drink, I am hopeless. And so Bill tells me this. My sponsor's name was Bill. And he said, Pat, unless you get connected vitally to God, you're going to die. And I said, wait a minute, why does this have to be a God program? There's a lot of people in the rooms that aren't saying that God's the answer. He said, yeah, and they're getting drunk or they're living lives you don't want to live. I go, well, help me with this thing. Help me with what you're talking about. And he said, this relationship with God is not about you getting things from God. It's about you forming a relationship with God. And I said, why is that so important? Because he goes, basically, he sort of started quoting some picture pages to me. He said, page 29 of the big book, Pat, it talks about the whole purpose of all the stories in the big book, all the stories behind the, the original text, 164 pages. It's all about how they formed a relationship with God. And then on page 51, he said, Pat, if you're having a heavy going of life, which I think you are, it's because you're not experiencing the consciousness of the presence of God in your life. And that sounded like gibberish to me, honestly. Like, I'm looking at Calvin nodding, and thank you, buddy. I'm sort of fixated on you, buddy, man. I'm with you. And I'm, I'm looking at all you guys. I'm thinking, you're not making sense. What you're talking to me about, Bill, is gibberish. And he said, I know. But I tell you what I want you to do. I want you to start reading pages 84 through 88 every single day for the rest of your sobriety. How long do you plan on being a sober, Pat? I said, man, it's been nine months. And it's like this, maybe nine months in a week. I don't know. I don't know. And, it's, and you're telling me it's not even up to me, but I'm telling you what, a bullet looks a lot better than this thing called sobriety. You could have it. And I was serious. I was going, if this is, if this is sobriety. I don't know what you guys are all smiling about because this blanks. All right. There's nothing good about this thing. You guys could take this stuff and go play with it somewhere else. Don't give it to me. And Bill wasn't, he was a parole officer and he wasn't scared off of me at all. And he said, come on back. And we started going through this book. By the time we got to this 11th step, I didn't even realize what had been happening, but a vision for God had been given to me. And I started having experiences with God. You know, we go through that bedevilments on page 52. And he said, can you see this stuff happening in your life, Pat? Can you see that you don't have any way to control your emotional nature, that your personal relationships are in the toilet, that you are a prey for misery and depression, that you don't have any answers for keeping yourself out of the bullseye of those two things? They're beasts. Exterior and interior, you're at constant civil war conflict with yourself. You don't have a prayer in heaven to beat this thing. You can't do it. Do you see that you are powerless over this spiritual condition? I go, yeah, I do. And without belaboring the point, I get to this third step prayer and it says, God is going to remove my difficulties. 
And Bill said to me, that doesn't mean external circumstances always. It means that your internal conflict can be resolved. That was a wise statement. And he said, Pat, you're going to become an evangelist. I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. He said, yeah, you are. If God does what God can do in this, in this program, in your life, you're going to become a walking, talking, this is a solution kind of guy, and it's going to be fun to watch. And the truth is, I'm an evangelist for this big book. The truth is, I can't stop telling everybody I meet that the power of God is incredible. The love of God is not to be missed. The way of life I have with God today is never second best to anything I see in anybody's life outside the program or inside the program. I love anyone. I, I love people today, which is a brand new thing. I hated everybody. I really, it was mutual. <laughs> so it really didn't matter. But I enjoy people today because I see them as God's kids. And I understand on page 49 that I'm literally an intelligent agent of God's ever advancing creation. What does that even mean? It means tonight, God's creating something between all of us, a connection, uh, an experience. Something's going on that God's going to use in deep and effective ways that we won't even know about. It's going to show up in ways that are un we don't even know. And that's another thing Bill said to me in my step 11 practice. He said, Pat, you don't know what's broken. You think you know what's broken. You think you know where your selfish self-centeredness starts and ends, this spiritual malady, which is a root of all of our troubles that we learn about in step three and four. But you don't have any idea how deep it goes. You don't know how to do surgery on yourself. Give you a scalpel and you'll cut your legs off. You don't know what needs to be there and what doesn't need to be there. So quit thinking you got it all figured out. See, I didn't even realize this. But the reason I picked this text from Bill is that I was rebelling against God even when I had relationship with God. Once I established the fact that I was hopeless and I was helpless and I was going to die, and it was progressively worse and I wanted to live more than I wanted to die, I said, Uncle, God, you could have me. And here is my prayer. I am not exaggerating. God, I have so blankly blanked my life that you can have it. You cannot possibly blankety blank my life any worse than I have. And that was a prayer for my heart, friends. It was a prayer for my heart. And what it was saying is that, God, everything that I know about me, I give to everything I know about you. And by the way, I don't know a whole lot about you. And God, one of the things I'm concerned about, and I talked to God like this. I said, God, I'm not sure if you're good. I saw a lot of things in my life and growing up that just were not good. Bill talks about that in his story. Fitz Mayo talks about that, his story in page 57. He had a lot of things. He's a minister's son, and he had a lot of bad things happening to him. He had a lot of bad things happening to him. And so I had this question in my mind, God, are you good? I had a lot of questions like, God, are you powerful? I had a lot of questions like, God, can you be trusted? I had a lot of questions like, God, can I rely on you when it's thick and thin? I'm in a business. I'm in, I, 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 I'm in a business where I got to make a living. I, I've got a relationship. I don't want it to blow up like every other relationship I've ever had. God, can I really trust you? Now, before I came in here and, and when, I, when I got sober, you might call me a little loose around the edges with my sex life. I was a walking dog. I was a dog's dog's dog. I couldn't keep faithful to, to anything or anyone. Not only sexually, I could, you couldn't rely on me. If I told you I'd be there at 10, it may or may not happen. If I told you I'll get it done, who knows if that'll really happen. But it sure sounded good. You believe me. That's what was important to me. I wanted your surfacy, real quick respect, right? And so when I came in here, one of the things I asked God in my sexual ideal part of my inventory was, God, I don't want to sleep with people that are not my wife. That was my big sexual ideal my first time through the work. And by the way, I go through the work almost every year. Been doing it a lot. In my first five or 10 years, it was three or four times a year, one through 12. And now it's probably once every year and a half to two years, but I go through it and I'm in the work all the time. Now, it may not sound much to you having a sexual ideal after those nine questions in the sex inventory of just saying, I just don't want to sleep with people that aren't my wife, but that was my sincerity. That was my truth. That's what I could, that's what I could try to say, God, please, please, please 
honest to God, God, will you please make this thing happen? And I'm proud in he to tell you that God is worthy of being trusted. I've never cheated on my wife, Karen. We've been together for 18 years. We'll be married 17 years this coming November, November the 1st. See, I remember the date. That's amazing too. And it's a miracle. In fact, when I show up with other women that aren't my wife, they don't think I'm on the game. They think I'm safe. How does that happen? It wasn't my will. It wasn't my power. That's a God event. See, the only thing that God ever asked me to do with him in my step 11 practice is, Pat, will you just be honest with me? When we do that evening inventory, I know you're rebelling against me. You got stuff in your life to this day that I still want to change. But will you just get honest with me in this evening inventory, for instance? And you know what? I am with Papa. I say, Papa, pretty good day. He goes, really? I go, yeah, it was a really good day. And, you know, by the way, the book says that I'm talking to God. And I'm saying, God, this book says it should be a constructive review. So we're not going destructive, right? We're going to be constructive tonight, right? And so I'm going through this review and I'm going, yeah, resentment's not too much. Uh, was I in fear? Not so much. Selfishness, you know, eh, not too bad. How about honesty? Well, the honesty might have been a little bit might have been a little bit of tidge off there. Well, what do you mean, Pat? What do you think? Well, I exaggerated a little bit. Well, Pat, you said black was white and white is not black. Well, that's a matter of perception, God. No, it's not a matter of perception. And so I have these kind of conversations with God, really like you and I are talking, but you know what? The blessing I have with God today is I don't hold back. Good, bad, or indifferent, I don't hold back, and I don't get surprised when I blow it, and I don't get upset when I didn't live up to what I wanted to live up to because I know that God's got better days ahead of me because I also learned I don't manage my spiritual development. I don't have the ability to manage my spiritual development any more than I can manage my physically getting sober. Both are an act of God and the grace and mercy of God. So I'm going through this evening review and it gets all done with these things and it talks about, was I loving and kind? Where could I have done better? Does it, you know, uh, did I hold back something I should have been talking to somebody about? Do I owe somebody an apology? Was I thinking about myself most of the time? Well, God, that's a hard one because, you know, I'm always sort of involved wherever I go, there I am. But you know what I'm talking about, where you're only looking out for yourself. Oxford Group says your, your motives aren't pure, Pat. You just weren't pure. You're really looking to game the system. You're looking to game that friendship. You're looking to game that situation. You just weren't pure. You're thinking about yourself. Or was I thinking about what I contribute to others? You know, I might not be showing up all the time feeling great. I might be emotionally a little bit down in the dumps. Being spiritually fit doesn't mean I always feel emotionally great. We have to de-link that stuff, that nonsense in the rooms of AA. If you're emotionally down, that doesn't mean you're in the spiritual malady. It does not mean that. The spiritual malady for me today is when I'm given the single finger to God saying, you know what? I want my way. I want to be God in my life. I don't want you to be God in my life. And I don't care what you have to say. I'm doing it my way. That's being in the spiritual malady. Now, I may know that consciously, or I might experience it unconsciously, but that's what it means to me today. And I'm going to be able to see evidence in on page 18, the alcoholic illness. I'm going to destroy relationships. I'm going to annihilate them. The tornado industry or inventory on 83. Look, Ma, the wind stopped blowing. And everybody else is still in shambles going, what the heck just happened? Well, that was just Pat blowing through our lives. Don't worry about it. That's just the way he rolls. You know, am I in that kind of condition or am I starting to li live a life that's bringing about not on my efforts? This is the power of God. Page 25 tells me it is the power of God. The great fact and the central fact today is that God gets in Pat's life and does things that Pat cannot do and take credit for. God does God stuff and it is beauty and it is be it's beautiful and I praise God for it and I thank God for it and I will shout to the heavens, God is great. So I get done with all this stuff, right? And I get to the end of this inventory at night and God says, Pat, there's one more thing I want to talk to you about. Have you asked me for forgiveness? Now that word, when I first came in the rooms, caused me to rebel against bowing a knee to God. I didn't want 
God's will in my life, if it meant I had to ask for forgiveness, that implied I made mistakes, that implied this ugly word that I did not grow up with a good idea about was sin. You know what sin means? Bill uses it in the big book. It just simply means missing the mark. In Greek, it's harmatia. It's just a, it's an archery term. I didn't hit the bullseye. I had good intentions. I had moral conviction. I had a philosophical good thing about life and I missed the bullseye. I showed up with Pat. I didn't show up with God and it got a little bit foobar. I call that codependency in Pat's life. And my wife will tell you it's alive and well. <laughs> codependency is alive and well, folks. And, and I, and golly, is that another is that another adventure, right? Man, I, I, I see God change in my life and I want to help God do his thing. And he says, Pat, 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 you're the agent. You're not the principal. You know, no, 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 no. You're the actor and quit producing confusion. I'm the director. Follow my lead. And here's where it gets. He said, Pat, would you ask for forgiveness? I said, God, what for? I remember asking God that early on in my step 11 practice. He said, why do I have, God, why do I have to ask you for forgiveness? I mean, every time you just want to rub my nose in it, you just want to rub my face in it that I can't get my act together, that I blew it again, that it's terrible. And he says, Pat, no, I love you. I'm asking you to ask me for forgiveness for your sake, not my sake. See, son, you need to have a clean heart and you don't work without a clean heart. You don't even operate well without a clean heart. And part of that process is I got to scrub a W. I got to scrub a W. And I need you to come to me and say, I didn't do what I needed to do. And would you please forgive me? You know, by the way, Pat, the reason is, is you played God out of the step three ex experience and it didn't work so well. We just went through the inventory tonight and you just concluded it didn't work so well. Let me clean you up. And once I truly start to experience forgiveness, step nine, step four, we start learning more about forgiveness. And by the time we get into step nine, my forgiveness is a living, breathing part of my amends process. In fact, it tells me I go with a uh, helpful and forgiving spirit to that man, that woman that I don't want to go talk to. Why? Because God wants to recreate in all relationships with myself, with others, and with himself. God's into restoration. God's into freedom. God is into creation. God is into abundant life. And I'm not talking about the bank account. That's not, I'm not making a political statement about that one way or another. That's not the point. Abundant life is that I could live with myself internally. And when I wake up, I don't have a party of 11 tell me what to do and why I'm a piece of dog. And you know what? And tell me all the ways my life's going to go terrible today. I don't wake up with those voices anymore. That's not part of what I wake up to. I don't wake up to that. How did that happen? Because I went to bed with my papa saying, Pop, will you please forgive me? I played God again. I can't even believe I did it again. He said, I know, <laughs> and you're not very good at it. <laughs> you, you sort of stink at it, but I love you. But, you know, let's hand back the reins. You got him. You got him. Now, quit worrying about it. Morbid reflection. Don't worry remorse pat i as far as east from the west i got you i got you see i'm a god pat that pursued you before you got sober and you weren't even looking for me and i was saving you when you were far off and you finally turned around and started coming back to me i didn't wait at the house i ran out on the street down the road got dirty coming to you and when I got you, I grabbed you in my arms and said, gosh, dang, it's good to see you, son. Come with me. We're going to have the party of all parties. You've come home. And I truly know that. My papa loves me through and through, and it makes all the difference. And I discovered that from my practice of step 11 and step 10. And you know what? I was introduced to the gospel that I was never apart from, as I discover, when I set aside my prejudice against spiritual terms. I learned my relationship, thank God, through Alcoholics Anonymous. I could have never, I never went to a church. I, I was abused by a minister. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Gosh, is it only that time? Oh, that's good. Ali, thank you. So I was abused by this minister um, in my late adult, in my late teens and early adulthood. And I was ashamed because, you know, I was a strong guy. 
and only a, only a weak guy gets taken advantage of. So I must have wanted to be something I wasn't, or I must, or maybe I was, and I didn't know. And I had all this stuff going on, and I was, and this guy was a, a minister of the church. And you know, there's parts of the guy's life I was really attracted to, but you know what? There's other stuff where he was broken too. He was wounded, and it took me six years into sobriety to make an amends to that guy. Yeah, I had stuff that I had to answer to to him. And when I first talked to Bill, my sponsor, about making an amends to this guy, I said, what the hell for? This is the guy that ruined my life. This is the guy that jammed me up sexually in my life. This is the guy that I, I didn't even have a good perspective of anything. This is why I didn't even want to pursue God. This is why everything in my life was into the, the pooper. You want me to go make an amends to this guy? He says, absolutely. You caused harm. And you know it. And I won't go into details. We don't have enough time. But here's the point. We ask for forgiveness for ourselves and we are able to give forgiveness for others when we experience forgiveness with God. It's the most powerful principle in the universe, forgiveness. It's the flip side of love. Nothing more powerful, nothing more powerful in this universe. God is great and he's a God defined by love. So I do this stuff. Man, I didn't know this was going to go this direction tonight, folks. I really didn't. This is sort of fun. This forgiveness has changed my life. It's caused me to learn how to be a truth teller at my work. And when I'm not the best at what I need to be doing, I could tell on myself and I could make amends. I could do 10 step. I could do this stuff because I'm not rebelling against God. And every morning I show up with God and I say, God, please separate the motives in me that are self-pity, dishonest, and self-seeking. Just take them away, God. And I ask God in the ninth step, will you please show me the way of patience, tolerance, kindness, and love for Karen, my wife. God, help me show up to love her like your child. I want her to know that she is the most precious child in the universe. I want her to know that if no one else in the world has ever told her that she is loved so deeply, it can't even have a, a depth or weight to it. I mean, it's just beyond all measure. It's from me. It's because of you, God. So we get to do all this stuff because of forgiveness and this forgiveness changes everything. And the final thing I'll sort of, I, I lost my training is my, my shepherds are barking. I had to replace six of my windows, in my front because of my shepherds they're crazy dogs. And I had these antique windows. I know it's really off the topic. And my, one of my shepherds, hundred pounder punched right through the window. And here's the miracle of God. He should have been severed arms and legs and everything else and not a scratch on him. Now, how does that happen? And it wasn't that safety proof glass. It was the jagged kind of glass and it didn't cut him. How does that happen? God is so good. He cares about all the details and other things that aren't so good. The things happen and people die and people have bad things happen. That's okay too, because God's there. And here's what I wanted to leave you with. I'm sorry. I got back to my train of thought in work because of forgiveness in work, because of thy will be done, not mine. God asked me to do certain things. When I turn my will and my life over him on a daily basis. I mean, I made that decision one time, but I renew it every day. Right. And I pray only for the knowledge of God's will and the power to carry it out. Well, I, I've been in the same job for nine years, and I have a lot of responsibility for a lot of people. In about every year and a half or so, God says, fire yourself. I go, fire myself? God, I got to make a living. He goes, it's my living. I'm your employer. I'm your father. I'm your director. I'm your principal. I'll take care of it. I want you to fire yourself from some of your responsibilities. This person over here is better at this job uh, duty than you are. I want you to promote her and demote yourself. So I go to my boss and I say, boss, I'm firing myself again. I'm not good at this one section of my business. I found somebody better. Let's promote her. He says, well, that don't mean that they're taking over part of your job. And I say, I know. And I don't care what it means for me, but it's be better for the company. <sighs> How did that happen? We lose interest in our little plans and designs and gain interest in our fellows. You know what my job today is? To love my people into the success of beyond me. I care about what happens to my peeps more than I do me. I care about what happens to my company and my employer more than I do me. And you know what happens? The opposite, the craziest thing in spiritual life. God gives you bonuses. God gives you promotions. God gives you more territory. And you go, how did this happen? I don't know. I just asked for direction one day at a time. That's what one day at a time meant. It was never to keep sober one day at a time. It was Dr. Bob and Ann Smith in their morning meditation say, God, today, 
thy will be done. Please give me instruction for this 24 hours, one day at a time. That, that was the deal behind it. It was Matthew. It was Matthew 6, 23 and 24. That's what it was coming from in the Bible. I, know, I said the magic word. Here's the point. Wherever God takes you in your step 11 practice, if I'm not afraid to bow my knee to God because I find out, like Sam Shoemaker told Bill Wilson, I'm closing with this. Bill was scared to death of having a personal relationship with God. He was really fine with the impersonal spirit of the universe concept. That was fine. But as soon as it became personal, Bill bowed his back and said, man, not for me, because that means I have to face old stuff that hurt me. I have to face old stuff that didn't seem right. And I don't know if God could un unwind all this territory, unwind all this stuff. And Sam Shoemaker, uh, rector, the uh, preacher over at uh, Calvary Episcopal back in the day, he said, Bill, will you please just give everything you know about yourself to everything you know about God one day at a time and try to do what you believe the will of God is today and you are going to prove for yourself that it is good, pleasing, and perfect. It's right out of the Bible, folks. Romans 12, verse 2. If we do the will of God, we're going to find that it brings us wholeness. It brings us health in terms of our spirit. And it brings us love in our heart. And we're going to belong like we never belonged before. God bless you all tonight. Thank you.